Hello everybody, today's episode I'm going to document and show you how to install a GM 4L80E electronically controlled transmission into my 1971 Cutlass, or more generally speaking, into a 1968-72 to General Motors A-Body. Okay, so let's go. And uh, so first of all, guys, as you can see, the car uh, doesn't have a windshield in it yet. It's, you know, being put together. Uh, but um, the place I'm at right now, uh, I really want to get the rest of the body put together, but I may need to modify the transmission tunnel. So there's a lot of aspects to the swap, um, including electronic controls. And if you have an analog speedometer, you're going to need something like this. Uh, so I'm going to go out to control the, to, to drive your analog speedometer. Um, so I'll try and cover the whole gamut and I'm going to document the process. I've made a comprehensive list of all the things that need to happen to put a, a, a four-speed automatic electronically controlled transmission into an A-body. Just remember, if you're going to install an electronically controlled transmission, for this discussion, this would be the 4L60E and the 4L80E into a vehicle that didn't originally come with one, then you're going to need an electronic control unit. Just remember, uh, the 700R4 became known as the 4L60 in 1990. 1990 and 91, the 4L60 was not electronically controlled. In 1992, it became the 4L60E. So if you're going to run either one, the first thing you're going to need is something like this. And this is the uh, TCI EZ TCU. TCU stands for Transmission Control Unit. And basically what you get in the kit is you get the actual, um, this would be the interface. This is the, you know, push the buttons and, you know, make the adjustments. Uh, this is the actual uh, transmission control unit. You can see there it comes with a big connector. And and it comes with a wiring harness with some different connectors in it. So that's the first part. Now that's not the only thing you're going to need. If you don't have a throttle position sensor, namely you're running a carburetor, then you're going to need something like this. And this is the TCI Automotive. Uh, this is the uh, 377450 remote TPS, throttle position sensor. Okay. This, you can see here, you may recognize that this cable looks like your, you know, cable that you're going to see like on a transmission throttle valve cable. Um, and this becomes your throttle position sensor. By the way, if you have something like the Holly EFI or, Term uh, you know, Terminator or Sniper EFI, then you can probably get away without the TPS because that'll be built into the unit. Now that's not all. Lastly, you're gonna need something like this. Uh, this is actually by Dakota Digital because it was significantly uh, cheaper. This is the Dakota Digital is ECD-200BT-1 electric cable drive for GM. So it comes with the you know, actual cable here. Uh, so no, this cable would connect the module to the actual speedometer inside your dashboard and the transmission would send a signal to this. You see that there? Okay. So, and it also comes with this cable here. Um, and I'm not sure, to be honest with you, what that is. It looks like another electronic, electric connector. So, this is what you need if you're going to drive a physical speedometer. You don't have electric, but you know, electronic speedo, right? Now, they're not inexpensive. All three of these things together are about fifteen to $1,600. So that right there is going to increase the cost if you're using an electronic, electronically controlled transmission. It's another 15, 1600 bucks, 1700 bucks maybe if you get the more expensive version of this that you're going to have to spend. So here are my thoughts on how you should choose which transmission you're going to use. So let's put in one camp the 204R or 700R4 slash 4L60. I guess the second group to me would be the 4L60E. The third group would be the 4L80E. Now, whether you're going to use an electronically controlled transmission or not. Um, I don't see a large advantage, although I've never used one. Would it be worth spending $1,500 more to be able to run a 4L60E versus a 4L60 slash 700R4 slash 204R? I don't think so. But um, would it be worth spending the extra money in both the build cost and the electronic control cost to be able to run a 4L80E versus the smaller, let's just call them, yes, I believe so, if, uh, and I created seven points that I'll put here on the screen. Number one, you have a heavy vehicle weight. I'm just going to say 4,000 pounds uh, or over. 
Uh, point number two, you have a big block and or larger cubic inch displacement engine, you know, 400 cubic inches or more. Numer numerically lower gearing. In other words, your rear end gear is like 323 or worse, you know, like 323, 308, 273. The lower numerically, you know, the smaller numbers, like a 256 gear, 273 gear is going to put more load on the transmission, believe it or not, than like a 373. You're running sticky tires, slicks or drag slicks. In other words, lots of traction. Um, point number five, harsh use, especially if you're going to drag race it or you know yourself if you're just the kind of person that beats on things like, you know, generally I have a history of. Uh, point number six, higher miles driven without tearing it down. If this is the kind of car you want to put together and drive for years and years and years and not pull apart versus, you know, something that's going to get torn apart every season and freshened every winter. I think that's another factor to go for the 4L ADE. And then you value reliability over a little bit of weight savings slash gas mileage savings or the budgetary concerns. In other words, if you can spend a little more and you want it to be really reliable, then that's leaning towards a 4L ADE. Does that kind of make sense? So in my books, if you have more than half of those seven points, I would say you should probably pony up and you know get the more reliable transmission. Myself personally, 1971 Olds Cutlass with a 482 cubic inch Oldsmobile big block. It's going to be like a, over 11 to 1 compression, aluminum heads, ported aluminum heads, air conditioning, uh, full interior. It's even a 12 inch subwoofer box in the trunk. This car is going to weigh every bit of 4,000 pounds with a 342 ratio axle, which is not that great for this type of car. I intend to drag race this probably a couple times a month, and uh, uh, I'm going to run like probably 295, 40, uh, 18 Nito drag radials, and I'm going to probably drive every chance I get nine months out of the year. It's not a daily driver car, and I don't want to service the transmission unless I absolutely have to. I am willing to spend, you know, a couple grand more to get the better reliability. I don't really give a rip at all about, you know, the fact that the transmission is about 43 pounds more than a turbo 400 or 200 4R right? Now, let's just say that I had a 1970 convertible, and instead, uh, I have smaller street tires, street-only tires. Let's say it's a 30 over 455 with cast pistons, uh, you know, and iron heads, and I know that it's never going to be drag raced because it's a convertible, right? You know, that kind of scenario. In other words, this is a cruiser. Let's assume also that, um, you know, I, I was budget-minded, right? And, you know, the cost is an issue. Well, in that case, I would run probably a 204R, I like the narrower gear spacing of the 204R, and it has a deeper overdrive. Uh, so the first gear is 2.76 to 1 instead on the 200 versus uh, 3.06 on the 700. Um, FYI, Turbo 400 and 4L's ADE are the same. They have a 2.48 first gear. Um, overdrive in the 204R is 0.67, so it's a better overdrive, more overdrive versus a 700, which is 0.7. And FYI, the 4L80 does not have as much of an overdrive. It's 0.75, one of the downsides. So in the example of this convertible option, I would probably go with a 204R, I think would hold up fine. So what we're talking about here, I was asking you about proper torque converter placement on a 4L80, and I think what you told me was you should push it all the way back, engaging the pump, then the torque converter should, from being all the way engaged, be between 0.125 or 1 8 inch to 3 16 of an inch, which would be 0.188, right? Yeah, the most important thing to remember, though, is to take a measurement from the face of the bell housing on the transit. Uh -huh. I have a bell housing here, but yeah. the face of the bell housing to the mounting pad on the converter should be uh -huh. 1 inch. That's, that's, that's the first thing. Okay, bell that housing... Way. Yep. Transmission bell housing mounting yep. surface. Yep. I'll put in a diagram here. To the mounting face of the 4L ADE, converter to flex plate mounting pad should be yep. one inch. Yes. Got it. Um, okay. that, that's a, because everybody says, oh, it should go in three clicks, but that's not always the case. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's two clicks and it's in, and the best way is to measure. So should I shoot for that versus bottoming the converter out and pulling it back which is more important they should I like probably to verify correlate. verify your measurement so always it, verify get it in there and you sometimes you can feel like you're bottomed out and you're not so okay. i stress to everybody measure, measure so measure, measure first measure. and then okay okay yeah. if you have it too far in you're going to crush or destroy the pump probably right yeah you'll you'll destroy the pump gear let me see i got a gear here so if you're too far in with your converter mm -hmm. um you'll actually push the pump into mm -hmm. yep. and start eating the pump. It, it pushes right here. Okay. 
And if you're too far those out, those are the tangs right there. Yeah, those those two the tangs, tangs engage the torque converter. Right. Okay. Pump. And if, if it's too far out, then it won't turn the pump at all. Got you'll it. You'll just be turning the. Okay. You know, you'll turn other things in the converter, but you won't circulate any fluid, and the car won't move. Got it. So. So bow housing face. Yeah. To torque converter mounting bolts on the converter one inch. And then verify that you've got between an eighth of inch or 0.125 to 0.188 clearance. Yeah, but maximum, not more. Yeah, maximum That's is it. 0.188. That's so, a pretty narrow range. Yeah. Okay. So in, in racing applications, we try to get it, tighten it up a little bit more than, than that. So this is the transdept uh, hardware that comes with the transdept kit. Um, is this important? This goes on the pilot bushing. I think they call yeah. the pilot of the torque converter. Oh, yeah. The pilot of the converter. The, the center hub of the converter has to be in the crankshaft. Mm -hmm. That's what centers everything. Okay. What's well, more important than the bolts, you know? I mean, the okay. bolts hold it, you know, keep it turning, but the converter, everything has to be centered perfectly. Okay. So, okay. Um, and so, it, this is going to extend the nose of the converter, basically. Yeah, that's going to extend it. So, yeah, if you're doing adaptation, putting it in a different vehicle, uh, this is critical, you know. So, let me get this straight. Do you have a torque converter hanging up on the wall? Uh, Okay, so uh, correct me from so this this surface here uh -huh. needs to be inside the snout of the crankshaft, yes, right? It yes. doesn't really matter so much how much as long as there's some in, yeah, right? Some and, in. No, it doesn't have to bottom out, right? No, no. Okay, yeah. got it, yeah. got it. Okay, those are the two tangs that the torque converter yeah. hub drives. Yeah. So if you're too far out, you know you're you're not grabbing very much of that gear to turn it. It doesn't mm -hmm. ride, but you don't want it buried in here either. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So, Okay. So that one, one two five to one eight eight, yeah, that'll get you perfect. Yeah, and that one inch is not the real measurement, but that lets you know that you're, in, that you have the converter fully seated. Right, and Got that's it. important because because you may think you're bottomed out, yeah. pull it back, and it's not seated. I yeah, think I, under, I understand that. Yeah, or, or a lot of times what happens is the converter will be sitting up here. Yes, and you'll go to, and it's it's tough enough to get the bell housing on the motor. Yeah, and you'll tighten up the bell housing. And some people just keep going, and in the bell housing, that's how you break a bell housing, is you're push, actually pushing up against this, uh -huh. and the bell housing just lets loose. Or, you know, you're putting a lot of pressure on the pump when you have the whole weight of the transmission and, you know, yeah, sitting. it's sitting right here. That's gotcha. not good. I, we want to verify that because we've seen it be mm -hmm. a problem so many times. That um, being the one inch. Yeah, the one inch. Yeah, okay. people think it's in all the way, and it's not. Gotcha. And, okay. Um, you know, it's just easier to measure than it is to to not be one hundred percent sure. Mm -hmm. and yeah, mm -hmm. but. Let's try that again. The weld was not sticking at all to the tube, uh, the schedule, the whatever, the the, the, the steel pipe because of zinc. Uh, galvanized, so it was just blobbing off like it was copper. So the you got to take the zinc coating. I forgot. Hashtag not easy. In case you haven't figured it out already, what I'm doing here is building a little bell crank system. You can see right. that the shifter location is farther rearward on the transmission, and I don't think the parking There's lever, uh, you know, the shift neutral. lever stuff that connects from the transmission up to the steering column is gonna fit. I know some people just leave it off, but on a street car, I think it's important. That gives you your backup lights and your neutral safety on the ignition key. Now I'm underneath the car, and I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do next. I have here a simple, uh, it's, uh, what do you call this, a protractor, magnetic protractor. And this is gonna be important later on. So uh, first of all, you can see here, I've already drained the transmission fluid because if I had not drained the transmission fluid and I took the drive shaft out, or the, in this case, the you know, drive shaft plug 
out. Transmission fluid would be pouring out right now. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna put it on the back of the transmission tail shaft and and I would say it's about one and a half degrees right now and that is uh let's see that would be vertical so one and a half degrees tail shaft down that's going to be really really important for making sure that you have the proper drive shaft angle this is a Buick Olds Pontiac bell housing pattern the dowel pins between the BOP and this is the Chevrolet bell housing pattern are the same you can see this one is very, um, you know, like triangular shaped at the top uh, with this hole and this hole directly in line with the dowel pin. BOP, the easy way to identify it is the lower bolt hole, again, is the same between Chevy and BOP. It's directly below the dowel pin, but this one is higher up and at an angle. And then these two are narrower together. That's about eight inches. You can see here on the Chevrolet, the top two bolts are spread out and lower. The way you get this transmission to bolt to a Buick Olds Pontiac bell housing is you use one of these. This is the Transadapt uh, bell housing adapter plate kit, part number 0061. It's pretty thick. It's made up of a little over 300 thousandths inch thick plate steel. Uh, these holes are tapped. Basically what you do with this is it would bolt up. I'll show you here how it works. The way this thing works is the plate bolts to the transmission with one, two, three, four bolts. And what they are is these are actually 3 8 fine thread bolts. Compare that to what you would normally use to bolt to the engine. On the right, the gold one is a 3 8 coarse thread. These fine threads are actually stronger, so that's good because you know, you've only got 300 thousands here of material holding the transmission to the plate. So that's actually a smart design. Um, it's not fully tightened, but you get the idea. So then the bottom two bolts would go through the transmission, the bell housing adapter plate and into the block. And then what you do on the top here is you, they come with, uh, you can see here, one, two, uh, and then the other two are actually behind here, three, and four, they are countersunk 3 8 bolts, and they're countersunk so that it can obviously fit flush between the transmission and the plate. So then you've got six bolts holding the transmission to the engine and the engine to the uh, plate. So pretty smart design. So now you can see I torqued the flex plate to crankshaft bolts uh, per the spec to uh, looked them up online to 60 foot pounds. These um, I torqued, I mean, it's, I think it says 30 foot pounds. That seems a little light to me. I'd prefer more like 35, but I can't get a torque wrench on them, so I approximated with those. But you do have to loosen up the flex plate bolts and pull it back to be able to get the plate on. The only thing I don't like about this is there's not much of the dowel pin sticking out i mean it's really not a lot of the dowel pin sticking out there at all um so yeah but um yeah, we'll go with it and per the instructions this is a spacer that goes in here oh look at that it slides in very nicely it's got pretty tight clearance in there um that's for the torque converter snout Okay guys, so what I chose to do was get the transmission up on the transmission jack, the homemade transmission jack, uh, you can see there. Without the converter, because the converter's, I don't know, 40 pounds or something, I should have weighed it. Um, it's pretty heavy. This is a uh, GM88H. Uh, uh, it used to be Dayco, now it's, I think, Transstar Converter. Um, I actually picked it up from them at the will call in Cleveland because I live near there. So this is supposed to be 22 to 2400 stall. It's only 180 bucks and it's remand. This is not the final converter. This is the one I'm putting in for now with the stock 350 until I get the 455 in. Uh, dogs are going crazy. But anyway, I think you get the idea here. So just make sure it's fully seated. If you go to bolt it up and the converter is hitting the flywheel before the case is bolted up, you're in trouble. Stop. One other point to note here, this torque converter, I don't know if you can tell, uh, but like for example, this lug 
is further in from, you know, closer to the center than that one is. There's two sets of lugs there. And I think that's for multi-fit, uh, LS, non-LS, I don't know for sure, but um, you know, there's two sets, so just beware of that. I think you only need to use three. Okay, so here's the first uh, fitment, I guess, um, analysis. So if we look there, uh, you can see the bell housing is not attached. It's close to being lined up though. You see the dowel pin, uh, I'll try and zoom in a bit if I can. There's the dowel pin and the dowel pin hole. The transmission is rotated slightly if you're looking at the back of the motor. The transmission is rotated slightly right now, um, counterclockwise. It needs to rotate slightly, but it can't. It's pretty level. So now the tail shaft needs to come up a little bit more, but what we're happening here is the case is definitely hitting this narrow part of the tranny tunnel. Um, this is hard to, it's hard to, not only hard to show, it's hard to see live. Uh, I've seen people say, that, oh, it fit by lowering the tail shaft. I'm not going to do that because that, again, throws off, you know, uh, angle of the drive line and then messes up your pinion angle, you, you know, but um, it's right here. I cannot, it is definitely hitting. I can't get my hand in. Um, and it's, it's this high part of the transmission. If I get a little more cord right there, it's this large... Part of the case this large part of the case is hitting the smaller part of the transmission tunnel it's not even hitting no i take that back this is the small part of the transmission tunnel it's not hitting that it's it, it's it, anyway it's right there so i need some way to mark that all right so i have the transmission up in and the areas of interference number one it is hitting right there see there is interference right there it's touching and the transmission still needs to go up another quarter to a half inch I'll show you another view transmission fitting I don't know how sharp of a bend something 90 degree might fit but I can put my thumb in between there that's about it there's more room on that one um, and then it's gonna hit no it is hitting as well these top two bolts let me flip the camera around I get a better view so I have the camera, obviously I have it on a, a portrait node, so I can get the lens up higher in the tunnel. You can see the two bolts here that are contacting. You can't really see back further, but it's contacting there too. So uh, I'll have to work on it, make some clearance. Okay guys, the transmission is down. Here's the same area as marked. I wanted to share something with you because I want to be you know, just, just fair and honest with you guys. This half, the driver's side floor pan has been replaced. It's an AMD floor pan, half floor pan. This side uh, was replaced uh, before I got the car, and I don't know what it is. This pan is not as accurate. You can see here, for example, it's just got a vague depression where the drain hole is. Um, and I don't know if you can see where it is. Mine actually have the actual drain you know, hole in it. If we're looking right here, I noticed something. This curve curves up it's not just shadows of the light it's a more definite curve i guess i would say in other words clear it's curves up more it's smoother here which you know that's part of where i need that clearance i think what i was going to do was cut uh, along here the trapezoidal piece out and then move it down then this curve up if i pulled this uh, imagine a cut line right where that radius stops if I pulled that cut line back, what is that, about two and a half inches or so, two and two and a half inches, I pulled that back to here, then this clearance would make room for these top two bolts. Um, and then it might help up here too, because then that would pull this larger area back, and that might make enough for up here. But I think I'm still going to have to put some kind of dent in it, and that's for this big protuberance here on the casting, which, let me flip the camera around. You're kind of on top of the transmission right now. Here's the large thing that hits. It's got an electrical connector on this side, but there's nothing really there on this side. So that's why this is one-sided, That the part that hits. Okay, guys, sorry that part of that got cut off, uh, but I moved the transmission and bumped the camera. Um, so here's the piece. 
it was here. The piece was here. I cut the strip out, that strip out. And my plan, I think, is I'm gonna, I'll have to massage it, it doesn't fit perfect, but I think I'm just gonna scoot that piece back and fill in that gap. Um, but I've gotta put the transmission back up in there to see if this actually creates enough clearance. Uh, oh my gosh, that was so difficult. All right, so I don't know if you can see up in here. Uh, it's close. It's not all the way butted up against the uh, the engine. It's still got, uh, I mean, it's it's close. Yeah, it just still needs to go up a good inch. Um, I think the tail shaft might be a bit high. But anyway, we're close, but it's hitting right here. Can you see? So I still need to, I know this is going to be annoying, but I'm turning the phone sideways. I need to cut more. Now, if you want to more clearly see the interference here, obviously you can see this is where the stock floor pan was cut. Um, and you can see I have to rock it. If I get this side lined up with where it was, um, there there's a gap on the other side and I can feel it right there. This protrusion right there hits and these two bolt holes here hit. Let me put it back. You can see clearly there. It's close enough where you maybe you could heat it up with a torch and a big hammer and pound it but I mean that doesn't leave you any room to get the transmission in nor does it leave room for when this stuff flexes so I think I'm going to move it back to about there I'm just going to trim about half inch off of each of the sides there I have to rebend it a little bit maybe bend this very edge of this lip up just a little bit to make it meet but I think that's what I'm going to do then I'm going to fill in a piece there and a piece there I think that's the the best way to do it um, and this weld and this weld could be done off the car and then I could grind those welds to be invisible on both sides. So then I just have one thing to weld. What I'm debating on is whether I butt weld it in or leave it like this. Maybe I just plug weld it in from the top and seam seal it. And that way, you know, if uh, I don't know, anyone ever wanted to put the floor back to stock, they could. I might even just do that. Just overlap it, plug weld it and seam seal it. Um... So you can see, by the way, I got the cross member in. So that's where it's going to sit. All right, guys, let me show you the problem that I've run into here. Um, first of all, before I go through all this, I know you can just go to Summit Racing Equipment, spend about three and a quarter, something like that, about 320 bucks or so for a cross member. But they're heavier. I, I just have a problem spending money on something I could make myself. So let me show you the problem with the stock cross member. I thought I was going to be able to just scoot it back and use it and flip it 180. The reason I say flip it 180 is you see the mounting holes are not in the center. They're biased. Um, the way this cross member was with the Turbo 400, those mounting holes, uh, let me get this straight. Uh, the mounting holes were closer to the back of the car. I'm using it with them closer to the front. Okay. I have to get it above the parking brake cables. Now, part of the reason, you see this cutout right here? This cutout, that was already there. That was a semicircular cutout. That was already there. It was a semicircular cutout. I joined the two, and it just gives you a little more clearance. You can't flip this the other way because there's so much meat up here. It hits the, gets in the way of the transmission pin. The basic problem is this. This crossover is one piece. To get it in, I have to angle it. Okay. Now, I'm going to try and show you the challenge here. So I have the transmission. See, those are the, the dirty brown holes where the 400 was. I actually needed to scoot it back because this transmission is longer. So I have it all the way forward there. Do you see the cutout there I made in that frame? You need that because, see, the transmission, the cross member sitting the transmission, I need that cut out. Let me see if I can prop the camera up. <laughs> so 
So what I just did was that notch is just enough to get it over the frame because here, you see that notch? Because here that notch I made clears just under the pan and then lets you, you see, tip this part forward to get it in. Now this is not a solution because what I thought was I could build a little bracket, an L-shaped bracket to patch that back over, uh, you know, a removable bracket. But if you see the transmission's up inside the car, so that's not even having a removable bracket there. Once I weld the floor pan in, this is not a workable solution. So I do have a plan for what I'm going to do to the cross member. And again, other solution, just go drop another 350 bucks. But just if you want to save 350 bucks and you can weld, I'm going to show you my solution. So the bottom line is here, really make this work to be able to get this cross member up in. It can't go behind this bracket. It has to go in front of the bracket. And let me also show you one other challenge. Let me put it in place. So here, let me get your bearings. There's the transmission, front of the car, back of the car. So here's that spot that I cut out. This hole is lined up. So this is how far apart the holes are. These holes are two inches apart. The holes in the cross member are two inches apart. These two holes are not two inches apart. These two holes are one and three quarters inch apart. So there's a couple of problems. Number one, I need another hole here, which is no big deal to drill it. But you see the frame is raised. That raised area is gone, which means now if you can tell this pad is touching the frame. This one is not. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, you could weld a spacer on or something under there, but so uh, it's just not a good way to do it all around for multiple reasons, okay? Let me drop this down. So now the weight of the transmission is resting on the cross member. The holes do line up. It obviously should line up because it's a turbo 400 transmission mount. So here's kind of my plan. You can see the cross number there in this drawing, right? I'm going to cut it. And then that cut's going to be, you know, like right here in the middle of this, of this section. And then I'm going to take this half, scoot it forward as shown here in the drawing. And I'm going to put two plates. So one side will have two plates. The other side will have only one. The side with one plate will, you know, in the same way, will be scooted and then welded. The other side, I'll have two plates so the two plates can be bolted, unbolted so you can get this thing in. So that way, that plate will bolt to that plate. There'll be a 3.75 inch offset. So see the front bolt hole here, this is 1.75 inches. So I want this front bolt to go to here. No, I want this front bolt to go to here. So that's a distance of... 1.75 plus 2. So that's 3.75 inches that this cross member is going to move. The reason for that is that means that the back hole will be here and the whole cross member on a flat part. Then I'm going to do is I'm going to widen it. I can either widen it to the front or the back. Doesn't matter. Maybe I'll just go to the back. And that's where you see that extra wing that I'm adding on. So instead of having just this much, it's going to have this much area in essence to clamp to the frame to the reason for that is the way it is stock this thing's really only taking load in you know just the downward direction but when you offset the cross member you introduce a torque and so that's going to help carry the load of that torque across a broader part of the frame
here's what I'm going to do. I mocked it up under the car. I've got it offset, you can see here, by two inches. And I've got the uh, 3 16 bar steel uh, to weld it together. So I'm going to weld this bar to this half and then weld this whole thing to this half. And I only need a two inch offset because I can now, because I'm going to have a two piece cross member, I can now run it instead of this hump back. What this does is this moves the cross member further forward. The front of the car is to the, you know, this way. So what that means is I don't have to have as much offset. All right, I've got it set up. Let's get it tacked in place. test for the So here is my final finished product on the cross member and I guess let me line it up and yeah, this would be about like that. So if we're looking at it from the plan view, the rear of the car would be down this way and you could see this part has been offset by exactly two inches. This side has been offset by two inches. You can see it's gusseted here 
right? Top and bottom. And on this side as well, top and bottom. That side is obviously fully welded. And I don't think my welds came out too bad. You can see that spattering there. That's a result of the flux cord wire. And then out on this end, obviously this end is the two piece removable end. Right, so what happened here was uh, I cut out when I sliced the cross member, I removed three eighths of an inch. In other words, three sixteenths, three sixteenths times two. That end, when I cut it in half, I only removed three sixteenths of an inch because I didn't want to change the overall length and dimensions and it worked out really well. You could see here, third hole. So now I'm bridging four inches to grab right a wider area on the frame. Uh, I still need to drill this third hole here. Obviously, I'll do that right now. Um, and uh, I'm really happy with it. Right. Welded top and bottom. I'm going to flip this over, let you see. See? Yeah, I'm really pleased with the way this thing came out. So it depends, time or money. You got 350, you know, something like that, somewhere between 320 to, yeah, more like 350 to 400 bucks. If you have to have it shipped, uh, burning a hole in your pocket, go buy one. Uh, but this is lighter, and uh, like I said, saving me about 300 and some odd dollars. I've got the energy suspension, polyurethane mounting. It is slightly taller, I'll compare it to the stock mount. I don't think it's gonna be a problem. You see it's got like, it looks like a spacer plate, uh, but the instructions say that is not a spacer plate, you must use it. I mean, it's ever so slightly, it's only like, I don't know, um, I'd say it's about an eighth, maybe three sixteenths inch, a little bit taller. I don't think it's gonna affect, uh, significantly affect the drive line angle, but we'll find out. Now for this part, you can obviously see the yoke is in there. It's pulled back out one inch, per the instruction from the drive shaft shop. And you can see there is the 3150 uh, yoke, and I'm gonna measure to that flat pad right there. And let's see if we can get this on camera. So I'm gonna with my left hand hold the, uh, hold the tape measure against that flat pad. Keep it there. I think that's 50 and a quarter. There, 50 and a quarter inches. Now, by the way, you'll notice that the rear axle is lifted up. I made that mistake the first time. The rear suspension needs to be loaded. You can see it's not on the jack stands. When I measured it with the rear end dangling, I got 49 and three quarters. So we need 50.25 inches. That's a difference of a half inch because of the suspension being loaded. All right, guys, I'm at Custom Clutch Joint and Hydraulic here in Canton, Ohio. I'll put the address on the screen. I guess it's Custom Clutch Joint and Hydraulic. And here I've got a beautiful uh, new drive shaft, 1350U joint. This is a 4L80. I think, yeah, it's the same as a Turbo 400 yoke, brand new yoke. Brand new drive shaft, three and a half inch diameter, if you can get an idea of the size of this sucker. I think it's 083 wall tubing and 1350 U joint down at the bottom. Um, it wasn't cheap, it was a little under 500 bucks, something like that. But these guys turned it around really fast. I gave them the length yesterday, um, less, basically less than a day they had it done. So uh, these guys are really good. They'll explain stuff, they do big truck stuff. They can even do carbon fiber drive shafts for 2000 horsepower, so. Um, all right, so let's get this thing put back on. Uh, let's get back home and put this thing in. Here is the drive shaft that came with my car. I think that section there I believe is like two and three quarters inches and this is three inches not bad these drive shafts this three inch part compared to like a g-body drive shaft looks large here's the new one this is a three and a half inch drive shaft like I said I picked it up from custom clutch joint and hydraulic um, in Canton Ohio uh, and this is a uh, whoops 1350 U joint this is the heavy duty U joint that you want to use for you know race applications and things like that by the way, uh, this U-joint here is an adapter U-joint. I had them put a new U-joint. This is a 1350 on this side, and it's something different, I don't remember, but smaller on this side. 
So what that does is just if I ever had to put the Turbo 400 back in the car, I've got a drive shaft. I actually picked up the correct spinometer gear for the 342, a 39 tooth driven gear. So that way, if I had to put the Turbo 400 for some reason, I have the transmission with the correct uh, spinometer reading for the 342 gears and a drive shaft that would get me from A to B. But I don't foresee a need with that. Uh, we're going to get this thing painted up, though. Isn't that awesome? You want to uh, not ignore stuff like this if you're going to make some power because you definitely do not want to break a drive shaft. You can see there, you can see there it is welded tubing. It's not, uh, you know, it's not seamless uh, drawn over mandrel, but I think we're going to be in good shape. It's balanced, ready to go. So here's my next challenge. You can obviously see there the uh, rear fluid port. That is, I believe, the return port. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see the other one. Uh, trust me, there, there it is. Uh, there is another one up there somewhere. Um, it's hard to see. Yes, it's got tape on it. But uh, that port right there, if I take... First of all, this port is designed to use an inverted flare. So there's a lot of different style. The factory style uses a push-in connector, which I don't want to use because I you know, don't have a push-in connector line. Uh, it's just not something I want to get into because then I'm either trying to find preformed lines that would happen to fit a 71 cutlass, which is probably almost impossible, or I go from that push-in connector and then it's just like a stub where the hose is cut off and I could clamp on rubber. A lot of people clamp on rubber, but I don't like rubber line i'd rather have a solid piece of metal than clamped on rubber or braided an for you know braided line for that example because this stuff like i said is especially the copper nickel line this is what this is you know it's corrosion resistant and uh you know it's it's strong corrosion resistant and less likely to fail and also another thing with this stuff is when you bend it it's going to stay in the place that you bend it so you can see here the radius if i have this down in this, I tried about seven, I threw about seven, six or seven of these away. It's obviously not in. I can't get it in. It interferes, but if this was in, it would be about there. That's about where it would be if it was in. If it was in, it would be about here. Angled down and slightly forward. And I think it would still not clear. It definitely doesn't clear, okay? Can't get it in. So what I'm gonna compare this to is I got different fittings. Here's one for the rear port with the extended coolant. You know, this has to go inside the transmission. Um, and then it's got a number six AM fitting on it. And then I can use this. So if I line them up, you can see how much narrower the bend is, the radius. Maybe I'll give you a section for scale. Those are all in the same focal plane. So I think this is gonna be the way to go. And that is compression, so that is going to be able to slip over and compress around. Solid metal line I don't have to use. Uh, I don't have to use, um, I will not have to use braided a in, so let's get that installed. So here's comparing the two fittings. I just pulled this one out of there. Uh, I like this. This is uh, from Fitzall, F-I-T-Z-A-L-L. -L. And you can see it is made for 3 8 inch line uh, with a compression fitting, which is what that setup is. Okay. And I flared that with a double flaring tool. I flared that myself. And it does have the proper O-ring connection. This is a straight thread with an O-ring. And that O-ring would seat right there in that little uh, angle pocket. And this one is uh, basically the same setup. I like this setup. This line is definitely going to fit better, but I still can't actually get it on. What that means is I definitely have to create clearance in the transition tunnel, even just to get this thing on. can tell but it is interfering and so the rear fitting is in it fits nice you can see here I did take the floorboard and I just took this open end wrench and I did flare it up a little bit to give it a little bit of clearance there and it fits nicely I have a kind of it's 90 degree but I have it aimed kind of forward I'll show you from under the car I have it kind of aimed forward at a 45 degree angle now here's the challenge. 
I removed the fitting at the front. I don't like this style. See, this has Teflon tape to seal it is all. No O-ring. It should have an O-ring. That one uh, has an O-ring. But it is so close. I can just... Uh, I can get my fingers sideways between it and the floor. We definitely are going to have to create some clearance for that. You know, because we need that kind of space. So I'm going to have to cut the floor there. So here's what I made. Let's see if that gives me some clearance. So what I have here is a piece of old uh, header tubing that I've used as a, I don't know what, but I'm gonna turn a curved piece into that, I think. Yep, this I think is gonna work. It's a little bit too aggressive right now, it's too deep, but this is what I'm gonna do. That's gonna work. Not sure if I'm gonna trim the patch to fit the floor or the floor to fit the patch, but you get the idea. It needs to be a little more curved here at the bottom, but it's, it's gonna work. So I figured I'd give you guys a little update here. Here's where I'm at. Uh, that piece, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. That's where the shifter cable is going to go through. That may change because that hole was here because I moved this back two inches. So you can see this little doghouse, the yellow tape. I'm going to cut those tabs off. Uh, this is two pieces here just because I ran out of material and I didn't feel like going by in a whole nother sheet. It's L-shaped at the bottom because I'm going to need a little more to kick out because when you bend it out, you know, I need more material. Um... But I think this is going to work. If you haven't used them before, these little toggle clamps are amazing. They suck putting them on because I've got that little bar on the bottom that pops out all the time. But once you get them on, it holds it in place with a beautiful little gap. So I'm starting to get this piece tacked in and I'll show you more. I think I've got that little patch where I want it. I know the gap isn't totally closed, but I can start welding that and then hammer it together. And it'll come out just fine. So I just did a technique called cut and butt. I learned from Fitzy's fabrication, F-I-T-Z-E-E. -E. So basically this piece was overlapping that piece just by a little bit. Once you get it close, take the right angle cutoff tool and you kind of, uh, you know, you kind of put it a little bit of an angle and you just got cut straight through. That only works though if you can take the, get to the back side to get the little strip out, which it's a transmission tunnel so I can. And I can see a little bit of daylight come through there, but now I got a really nice tight gap and I can, uh, you know, get it flat now. As you can see, I did make two relief cuts, one there and one there. In other words, what that kind of did was let this portion shrink down in, which is what I needed. So I think it's going to work now. And here's where I've uh, got to with this patch. And that should make plenty of room. It does make plenty of room for the fitting. Now guys, I try not to be afraid to mention when I'm wrong or say when there's a better way to do things. I'm not telling you how it should be done. I'm telling you how I did it, why I did it this way so that you can make your own judgment. One of the areas is there's things called a banjo fitting. I'll put a picture here on the screen of what a banjo fitting is, but in short, it is a fitting where it can mate directly up against a, a, a surface and then you can get fluid going 90 degrees. At first, I didn't like the concept of the banjo fitting. I thought it would restrict flow. 
I, I thought my way was going to be a kind of a cleaner, neater way to do it. But in hindsight, with all the ugly welding and grinding and welding I had to do to get the floor to fit, I think that's just as good, if not a better solution than what I did. Uh, in addition, since doing this and posting and reading some things online, there's a lot of guys that have used banjo fittings on 4L80Es with absolutely no problems running them long term. Now here's some pictures of how the floorboard turned out after I finished welding it. Again, that back area that you see, the shiny area, uh, that was enlarged in diameter. The middle area is that doghouse that was scooted back. And then there's the front area where I had to add in a little bit of, I think it was about two inches a strip of that filler metal. And you can also see here the humps, the two humps that were created to clear the lines for the transmission cooler. Okay, here is my oil cooler and the uh, mounting brackets. This is for the transmission oil cooler. Uh, I just took some flat sheet metal, uh, cut it, and then I bent it into a U-shape. You can see there, it gives it a little rigidity. Um, and I made it narrower here at the top because that fits down on the bottom side of this piece of the radiator core support. And then I also have little L-shaped tabs here, spot welded on there. And then I don't know if you can tell on the bottom side, I welded uh, number 10 uh, uh, nuts on so that I don't have to, you know, try and pull the nut with a finger. It'd be awful to try and put that together. Trying to hold the nut on the bottom. So the nuts on, you know, um, all the places, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eights are welded on as well as you can see them uh, underneath there as well. And I think this is how it's going to, how it's going to work. So this one is hanging from the bottom side of the radiator core support. It will be up here at the top and I'll have the engine oil cooler at the bottom. There it is. I wasn't sure how solid it was gonna be. Yeah, that's nice and solid. You can see the screws up there. And I used the countersunk screws. I tried to countersink the, that hole there by bending it down uh, with a punch, didn't bend as much as I would hoped, but we zoom out a little bit and you can see here we still have plenty of room for uh, the oil cooler underneath. And here's the transmission hard lines in, AN fitting, 90 degree, 90 degree, uh, 3 eighths copper nickel hard line, and I got it all in one piece. I'm pretty happy with that. Here's the underhood pusher under hood portion where the lines come up and I made a hole right there you can see the hole and I put um, I used a fuel line and here's where I made the hole I put a piece of vacuum tubing I slid it to you know effectively give it a grommet and you can see that they then connect up to the cooler all plumbed in one piece of hard line through the grommet and down to the transmission. Left up here, left I have the Summit 702210 locking dipstick for the 4L80E. On the right I have FTI part number uh, F8056. They look like they're pretty much identical to me um they look pretty much identical uh, i think this is like 51 bucks this is like 41 bucks so uh but i don't think either one are going to work let me show you why just doesn't fit past the firewall it's pretty tight here with the firewall down in here so you can see here this tab you can see here this tab would go on one of the bell housing belt uh, bu bell housing bolt holes. It, I'm, I'm fiddling with it here for several minutes. The only way I can get it down is twisting it sideways. Obviously, that's it's just it's just not going to work. I think I'm gonna have to get a flexible dipstick. So I picked up this low car transmission dipstick tube assembly. So it comes with a tube braided and it's flexible and if you see the dipstick itself is round compared to a stock one that is 
flat. So when it's flat, you can really only bend the tube in one plane. So I think what that means is this can kind of go anywhere. They come in a, uh, a few different brands make them. Uh, there's 24 and 36 inch. I opted for the 36 inch, which I think is going to be a better fit, but I'll show you. Uh, a lot of the reviews on the 24 inch one said that it was just too short. So here's Summit Racing's version of the uh, flexible transmission dipstick tube. It's Summit part number SUM-702203. It was just under $130. It does come with the, the grommet thingy for the transmission. Um, and this one is 24 inches long. The other one was way too long. I should have took a picture of it, but the handle is like way up here. This looks like it's going to be just about perfect. It might be over here. It might be down more. It might be up more on the side, but it's going to be somewhere in this area here, dependent upon this vacuum ball and uh, possibly a control module for the spark with the, um, the, the Holly fuel injection. So you may have heard me say Holly EFI at the end there, if you caught that. So here's what I did. By the way, thank you, Ken. Um, I returned the TCI Easy Transmission Control Unit 950, is what I paid, uh, the remote TPS 214, returned the Holly 4150 carburetor. That was 880 bucks when I got it. Uh, MSD Blaster 2 coil for 70 bucks, and the MSD Pro Billet Distributor for 590 Instead, I got the Holly Terminator X Max Stealth 4150 EFI. That's part number 550-1013. Uh, that has uh, the, the one throttle body with four 100 pound per hour uh, um, um, the fuel injectors in it. Supports up to 650 horsepower. 900 CF, 950 CFM throttle body, I believe it is. Uh, then I also got the Holly Sniper EFI Hyperspark 2 ignition box, $350. Holly Sniper EFI Hyperspark coil for $52. Holly EFI dual sync distributor for $354. So the parts that I returned were $2704. Full price for the new parts would be $3228. So that's roughly $500 more. The reason I did this is because it finally dawned on me, again, thank you, Ken, that the Holly Terminator X Max Stealth not only is obviously electronic fuel injection, also controls your distributor the way I did it. You can electronically control the distributor, no more advance weights or vacuum advance, but it also controls the transmission. I'll repeat that. The Holly Terminator X Max Stealth also is a TCU built into it. It's a transmission control unit built in. The only other thing that I have to buy over and above this, it's really not just a $500 price difference, you'll see, is the fuel pump setup. So that'll come later. Um, I'll show you hooking all this stuff up in the EFI video. And it's all painted. You can see here, obviously, the uh, center console is going into. It's all painted up. Looks good. Center console fits. So as it sits right now, as you can see, the transmission is in. It is bolted up. As I already showed you, the lines are hooked up. Drive shaft is in, and so is the drive shaft safety loop there. That's important if you're going to drag race the car, and everything's hooked up. So from a physical installation standpoint, it is in. And again, um, all this stuff is going to go in a separate episode. Here is the electronic, uh, this is, the, I should say, the wires uh, for the transmission, and that's part of the Holly, a Terminator X Max Stealth. You can see the connector uh right there it connects to this uh relay there's a lot of stuff that goes along with this it's a lot of wiring so you can see all of this wiring harness for the holly efi here's the brains for the holly efi here is the throttle body with fuel injectors inside of it looks like a carburetor but no venturis you see those little holes there so uh and there is the uh, dual sync distributor and then uh this controls the spark and then we've got a regulator here. So a lot of cool stuff coming up, as well as a custom uh, fuel pump and fuel tank installation. This will all be documented in another episode. I am Cobbler Bob from Cobbling and Cars. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Thank you for watching.